Hello, this is Dr. Oviedo. Today I'm going to discuss the transmission of COVID-19. I'm going to do that by reviewing a paper written in the New England Journal of Medicine on March 12th. The title of this paper is Aerosol and Surface Stability of SARS-CoV-2 as Compared with SARS-CoV-1. SARS-CoV-2 is the COVID-19 virus. This is the paper I'm going to be reviewing. Before we begin, I want to discuss some general principles regarding transmission of respiratory illnesses. You may have heard a lot of people talk about droplet transmission and airborne transmission. I want to discuss this giving an example. Let's say I'm not feeling well and I'm sitting here and I cough. There's two major things that happen when I cough. One thing is droplets of fluid can come out when I'm coughing and land on the table in front of me. The other one is that very small particles can come out of my mouth and be suspended in the air. The droplets of fluid that land on the table can then be touched by someone else that comes and sits where I was sitting and then if they touch their face, of course, if I am sick, the disease can be transmitted like that. That's called droplet transmission. That's the reason that we keep getting told to wash our hands because washing hands is very effective at decreasing droplet transmission. In addition, you have to remember if I'm sitting very close to someone and laughing and talking and coughing, of course, I can also deposit droplets directly on their face. The other thing I talked about was airborne. Now remember, these are tiny, tiny particles that get suspended in the air. These are different than the droplets on the surface. When I cough, the airborne particles can remain suspended in the air. If someone else comes into the room and then breathes those particles that I coughed into the air, that's called airborne transmission. Another example I want to give to make it very clear the distinction between the airborne versus droplet is if I'm coughing in this room and then I get up and I leave the room and then someone else comes into that room. If that person can breathe in the airborne particles that I coughed up, that is called airborne transmission. In the real world, there are a lot of variables that affect these two types of transmission. Imagine, for example, if the surface I coughed onto was wiped down, the transmission would be much less. Or if the person that came and sat where I was sitting and put their hands down on the table, washed their hands or used hand sanitizer. In addition, there's so much variability. Am I inside? Am I outside? There's a lot of variability with droplet transmission. In addition, there's also a lot of variability with airborne transmission. Imagine if I just cough once and then I leave the room and someone else comes in. The risk may be low depending on what I have. Am I early in the illness? Am I in the middle of my illness? Am I late in the illness? Or have I just spent three days in bed coughing in this room and then I leave and then someone else comes in? Is there ventilation in the room? Am I wearing some type of mask as a patient or as a sick person? Am I wearing something? So there is a lot of variability in the real world. This particular paper discusses these concepts in the laboratory setting. They made tests in the laboratory. So at this point, I want to discuss their findings. First, let's discuss a summary. They used SARS-CoV-2, which is the name of the virus that causes COVID-19. They compared the transmission of the COVID-19 virus to SARS-CoV-1. SARS-CoV-1 caused a disease commonly referred to as SARS in Hong Kong and Toronto in 2003. That was a very sad occurrence because there were a lot of healthcare workers that acquired this and died in that time. The reason these are good comparisons is that both of these are coronaviruses and they're closely related, so it makes sense to compare them. SARS, of course, stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. The investigators in this paper generated aerosols in a laboratory setting in order to mimic aerosols generated by the human respiratory tract. They tested various environmental conditions including aerosol, which I have used the word airborne, and then they also tested surfaces, including plastic, stainless steel, copper, and cardboard. This is the figure they used in their paper to show the data that they found. The top row labels the various environmental conditions that they tested. 
they tested aerosols, copper, cardboard, stainless steel, and plastic. The first row refers to titer, which is a measurement of how much virus is left after a certain period of time. Here on the right, you can see I put a rectangle around SARS-CoV-2, which is the COVID-19 virus, and it has that kind of reddish orange color in their various charts. The most important finding is on the top left. You can see I've circled where the virus continues to have a fairly high titer even after three hours. This figure also shows decay, which is how much the virus loses strength over time. Here again on the right, I put a rectangle around SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19. The bottom row is data which shows half-life, which refers to the time that half of the virus is viable. So what are the results? COVID-19 virus remain viable, but in reduced amounts in aerosols for the duration of the experiment. Aerosols is kind of the scientific word for airborne, meaning airborne transmission is possible. On plastic and steel, the COVID-19 virus remained viable, but decreased at 72 hours. On copper, the viable COVID-19 lasted only about four hours. On cardboard, the viable COVID-19 lasted about 24 hours. Here are the conclusions. COVID-19 virus can be transmitted by droplets on surfaces. We already know this because we're constantly being told to wash our hands, wipe down surfaces, and use hand sanitizer. In addition, COVID-19 can also have airborne transmission, similar to SARS-CoV-1, which caused SARS in Hong Kong and Toronto in 2003. This is also very important to understand. These findings have to be interpreted in the context of community versus healthcare setting. For example, in healthcare settings, there are procedures which may generate aerosols and cause airborne transmission. For example, intubation of a sick patient is expected to generate aerosols. However, if the healthcare workers are wearing the proper equipment, the risk of transmission would be expected to be low. Okay, that's it for the discussion of this paper. I encourage you to read the paper and learn more about the transmission of COVID-19. I also encourage everyone watching this video, including community members and healthcare workers, to do the best you can to prevent transmission of COVID-19.